My name is Edward H. My TDC number is 853824. I'm in here for murder. Who will win on judgment day? I'm innocent. I didn't commit the crime. On the evening of July 23rd, 1993, just outside of Tyler, Texas, the body of Elnora Griffin was found on the living room floor of her home. Griffin had been fatally stabbed. One month later, authorities were confident they had their man, Edward Eights. Ed and his younger brother, Kelvin, grew up country kids. He loved the outdoors and playing sports, in particular, basketball at any cost. My dad used to tell us to come home, take our school clothes off before we go play. My brother would get off two bus stops up, get off and go play basketball. Do you hear me? I'm like, yeah, well, all you got to do is come home and take your clothes off, man. Keep both of them getting a butt toe up. Show sure enough, daddy sneak home, whatever you go, whooping, just like three minute oatmeal. Ed, like most kids with a love of the game, suited up for his high school team. It's a fun conversation today. Anytime we talk about basketball, of course, uh, he was the star, he was the beast, he was the best there was. You know, he was a lot bigger than he was good, but he played hard and he wanted to be good. A lot of kids play the game to, to be able to say they played. There's a certain group that you know has a passion for the game. I would put Edward in that category. But sometimes life can turn as fast as a flip of a coin. And so it did for Ed. His aspirations of playing college ball fell short because of some off the court issues. And it only got worse from there. Ed became the prime suspect in the murder of his former neighbor, Elnora Griffin. He was her handyman and neighbors told police he was at her home the night of the crime. There were also inconsistencies in his alibi and within a month of the slaying, Ed would be arrested and charged in Griffin's murder. There never was strong evidence against Ed to begin with, and the jury just couldn't come to a unanimous decision. Ultimately, in July of 1996, Ed's case ended up in a hung jury. Ed took this as his golden opportunity to put this nightmare behind him. He met and married his wife, Kim, and five months into her pregnancy with their second child, the unthinkable happened. Ed was arrested a second time, again for the murder of Elnora Griffin. This time, for starters, they had an all-white jury. They also brought in a new forensic expert that had testified about some forensic evidence that now tied Ed to the crime scene. And then the state introduced the testimony of another jailhouse inmate, who ironically later admitted that his testimony was all a lie, but well after the fact that Ed was found guilty and sentenced to 99 years. Ed and Kim were resigned to the fact that if ever released from prison, Ed would have spent the majority of his life behind bars, or alternatively, he would just die there. Devastation, um, my whole world just come crumble down. In the very beginning, time was moving so slow. In 27 years, he would be eligible for a parole. There was no way in the world we could reach 27 years. Time, arguably the most precious gift that we possess. For Edward Eight's time was a curse, a precious gift that was taken away. But as incredible as it may sound, the one thing that freed Ed from the walls that confined him was the one thing that not even prison could deny him, basketball. That's what basketball or sport does. It gives people a peace. It gives people a release. It gives people a chance to go into that arena where they forget everything else around them. The love of basketball gave him that outlet that he needed to be free mentally. You never know what type of dark place a person is in, and you never know what gives them that light, and basketball was his light. But one of the darkest memories of Ed's imprisonment was the loss of his mom and grandmother and his inability to grieve with his family. I didn't know what I was going to do. And then about maybe two months later, the phone rang. It was my brother. He said, man, you know I'm getting out. And I'm like, what? For Ed, this time the flip of the coin was in his favor. That Truth and Justice podcast that decided to look into his murder conviction 
clearly proved to be the spark that caught the attention of the Innocence Project of Texas and to his eventual parole from prison. I came out, I was choked up, could barely breathe. I had tears in my eyes. You know, I saw my son, and he came to me, and he hugged me. I love you, buddy. Love you, too, man. We're going to be all right, okay? Oh, shit. It was the best feeling in the world. I love you, man. I love you, too. I love you, Dad. <laughs> Zach had never seen his father outside of those prison walls. For him to yearn for his father's presence was overwhelming. But that day, we will never forget. God took my mom and then gave my brother his angel wings and sent him to me. And now we're back together again. <laughs> After serving 20 years in confinement for a murder he refused to claim, Edward Ates was a free man. I felt kind of like a, a small sense of relief that I'm finally going home today. I'm finally going home. I mean, it took 20 years for me that I'll never see again. They took my life. At the end of the day, the thing that really helped Ed get parole was biological proof that what the state thought proved he did it, proved actually that he didn't. That forensic evidence was a specimen lifted from Ed's shoe that allegedly tied him to the murder scene, later proven to be false, not credible. Frederick Douglass was once quoted as saying, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Following his parole, Ed couldn't wait to do just that. Refuse to lose. Every day I wake up and I choose. I've been through it all. Take a walk in my shoes. Hey man, my name is uh, Edward Aches. I was incarcerated for 20 years, wrongfully convicted of a murder case. By the grace of God, I'm a free man today. This is my getaway in prison. Seven days a week. It's what I did. I was having some kind of problem, but I go play basketball. But it's hard. You got to fight every day, try to redeem your name. You just don't want to go down that road. You don't want to make the wrong choice in life. There wasn't a set of wandering eyes on the gym floor. Ed's message was well received. To lighten the moment, Tigers head coach Farron Douglas surprised Ed with an invitation to show off his skills in a quick one-on-one -on -one matchup against one of his ball players. Hey, don't do me too bad. Come on, I'll play with you a little bit. Come on, you ready? <laughs> Despite Ed's parole, being reunited with his family, and even enjoying the role that sport continues to play in his journey, Edward Eight's wait for his total freedom is far from over. I want a full exoneration. Unfortunately for Ed, his parole is neither a legal validation of innocence or guilt in regards to his murder conviction. However, his legal team is now pursuing his full exoneration. But until that time, if ever, Ed will remain a convicted felon. I want to, you know, to be able to say that I'm fully free. I want to be able to talk to people without them saying you're that guy incarcerated for killing that lady, you know. I just want my name back. Griffin's murder remains a mystery, and yet again, the precious gift of time unfortunately remains uncertain in regards to Edward Eight's exoneration. On judgment day. In Dallas, I'm Arnold Payne. Mm -hmm.